Hello, everybody, and thank you for the invitation and the possibility to be here uh, to share our Swiss experience with you here in Scotland. Um, it's the third time I'm here in Scotland now, and I'm getting attached to the country, I would say. Um, but what really intrigues me is, um, well, the question, how can we share the experience we have made in Switzerland with you uh, to help you to get your course uh, forward. And um, I think there's quite a few things to, to be told. Um, one thing in Switzerland was the, the problem pressure must be um, pretty important, otherwise there is no movement possible. Switzerland is not a very innovative country and um, what happened there in the early 90s with the heroin epidemic that was an important problem and um, that was reported on Worldwide. Uh, and um, uh, so people were ready to, to change and, and to sit together and, sh uh, and discuss. And I think this is a process that is very important to uh, get politicians and uh, experts of, from the field and uh, civil society together and to into sort of process to find new solutions. And so I will share the Swiss way with you. And um, I was already kindly introduced uh, uh, with uh, and the, the organization as well. Arut is a non-profit, non-governmental organization. So we have got the freedom to be active and uh, decide to, to proceed as we think is, uh, is right. And that, that's a, a good thing sometimes. Um, Arut operates two um, head centers in, in, in Zurich. Um, and the two other clinics, they have no license for head. We will see that later on. Uh, head is a rather restricted um, treatment offer in Switzerland, uh, unluckily and it can only be offered in licensed uh, centers. As we have already heard, we're treating about 2,000 uh, patients, uh, about 1,000 of them in, in ONT and HAT, um, which a number which is uh, constantly growing, uh, although uh, opioid-dependent patients or people are uh, like a cohort that isn't growing anymore, even uh, getting smaller. But I think it's due to our uh, treatment offers that we're still uh, getting more and more patients into a treatment. Um, I think what is really important and what we've heard, learned over the years is that we have to work together. Um, uh, the, the patients we are uh, working for, they are multi-morbid and complicated cases and all the, the speciali specialists have to share uh, their experience and, and, and knowledge and to get for every new patient a new case together. And uh, that's uh, collaborative work amongst the experts with the patient. And so interdisciplinarity and integrative uh, services is a very essential part, I think. Our treatment concept, that's a product of the, well, the work we did uh, in the beginning of the heroin epidemic in Switzerland. Uh, it's very much influenced by ideas of um, harm reduction. I think the, the most important thing is the quality of life and, and health of our patients. And However we can improve on that is okay, and uh, there is not, no absolute goals that have to be reached. It's always the question, what can the individual patient, what is he able uh, or to, to reach, and what is he motivated to, to, to do, and, and that's limiting, and, not, and we shouldn't focus too much on our goals or wishes as, as experts. So we have to be very flexible and, and patient-oriented. And we have to be easily accessible. I think that's one of the most important uh, factors. Uh, in our centers, uh, patients, they can just walk in if they want to get into a, a, a opioid maintenance treatment without further notice. And they are into treatment within 20 minutes. Uh, so I think 
that's the way it should be. Uh, th there should be no waiting list whatsoever, not even for two or three days, if possible. Um, and there should be no barriers in, in treatment and no constraints. There should be no sanctions or uh, like punitive aspects. Um, I think uh, treatments have to be adapted to, to every single patient and every single patient is different and they don't adhere to certain rules because they might be uh, comorbid, they might have psychological problems or mental problems and they, they shouldn't be punished for that. Uh, I think the, the treatment services have to adapt to, to the patients um, so as there is hardly any barriers in our institutions. Um, what I want to do, go through with you today is um, like the, the link to harm reduction again, uh, I've already addressed that, um, and give you an idea what what's OMT and, and HAT is about in Switzerland. Uh, I want to introduce into the like specifics how we do that in, in, in uh, at our centers and have a discussion with you later on. Um, who knows this place? This dreadful place that could be somewhere in South America or uh, whatever. This is the Needle Park in, in Zurich. Um, who has heard this? about Needle Park. Um, I, I'm always wondering, we, we, we were um, talking about remembering and uh, getting into action and um, in, in Switzerland this is really uh, uh, getting a problem. This is uh, um, 20, 25 years ago and, and quite young, young people and also politicians, many of them haven't seen this or haven't gone through that and um, so they, they, they don't see the problem anymore because uh, this needle park looks like this today uh, and that's all over Zurich the case. We don't have any open scene anymore. There is no, no public injecting or anything like that. It all, it's all happening in, in w w what we have like sort of um, for, uh, formed as services. Uh, the, the safe injecting rooms, the, the, all the, the treatment centers um, and people don't disturb in the open, in the public anymore. So I think that's a problem with the success, success of our treatments. Um, we are sort of being confronted with now uh, because politicians talk about cutting down funds for, for uh, treatment services uh, like ours. So this is the uh, therapeutic uh, Pyramid. I don't know who is familiar with that because the, the classical um, addiction pyramid has always uh, abstinence on top and we have like, changed that and, and, and we think that abstinence is no goal whatsoever. Abstinence is a state that can be good or bad depending where you are at. Where you are at. And, um, so Defining goals is not about thinking of, uh, about abstinence or not. It's about thinking of stabilization, of, of um, ensuring survival in the first place. Uh, you can't treat uh, dead patients. Um, um, it's about reducing harm and it's about stabilization and it's about improving coping skills and, and this is all together what, 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 what we call um, what's the word you have uh, for um, recovery uh, that's our picture of recovery and it's not linked to abstinence whatsoever um, I think that's another question and I think this approach was pretty successful um, the, the drug deaths, they were only um, taken until 2007 L and luckily we don't have any further numbers from then on but they rather decreased further and, and you see um, they are pretty stable now and we don't have any rise in, in death numbers. So what's the supply with the OMT in, in Switzerland like. Um, 
It's about 17,000 of 20,000 problematic uh, opiate users are in, in treatment. That's, um, that's corresponding with a coverage of ab about 65%. But 90 to 95 percent of all the opiate users already have the problematic users have been in treatment already. So um, it's a sort of a rotation in and out of treatment. So uh, and we think people um, rotate in and out, and, and uh, on a given day, it's about 65 percent in treatment. And as you see here, only. 1,500 in, in heroin assisted treatment. I think it, this could be many more. Um, so I think that's a guess. But about 30% of the population we see uh, would fare better with um, heroin assisted treatment than in regular uh, ONT because they just don't tolerate long acting substances. And, and this is a fact. Uh, some people do tolerate and do prefer long-acting substances and other people they do need the short-acting act substances and the, the flash, what they call uh, the fast on, on set, onset of action. That's uh, like the provision with the uh, treatments in, in, in the canton of Zurich. What is very important for us is that about 50% of the treatments are offered by, by GPs. Uh, that's very important, I think, to give the patients more choice of treatment uh, uh, than just having the choice between two or three big centers. And um, So it gives mo much more flexibility to the treatment uh, offers. Um, yeah, this was the GPs, and this is our, our bit here. We have heard um, substitution treatment, maintenance treatment is a protective factor, and um, it's one of the most effective medications, if you like, uh, if you consider the, the reduction of mortality you can have with a, a medication. Um, and this is another interesting aspect. Um, like, as more people are in uh, maintenance treatment, less inject. Uh, that's what we see in Switzerland. And um, this is a really important message, I think. Uh, injecting drugs often is like uh, a reaction to shortage or to, to um, like it, if people have to buy expensive drugs on the illegal market, they they tend to inject them to save money or to not to to waste the drugs, and and this aspect is getting less and less important. The better the, the people are treated, and this is another thing um, which is I think very important to me uh, because I'm really concerned convinced that uh, we have to individualize treatment, uh, uh, substitution treatment, because not everybody fares well with methadone. We started uh, off with methadone 100% because there was nothing else. And then we, we find out that, that some people drop out and, and don't tolerate methadone. And uh, the other substances came up, that, that was buprenorphine first, like in the 2000s. Um, then 2007, we started with uh, slow-release oral morphine, first in a study, of, and 2013, it was licensed in Switzerland. And the dotted lines are the numbers of the canton of Zurich, and the, the straight lines, that are our numbers in the, our centers. And you see, uh, in our centers, the diversification is much more uh, ahead, and I think that's a trend we will see. Uh, we have the same trend in the canton of Zurich, but they, they, they will come after. Uh, this will f grow further. Um, I hope heroin assisted treatment will grow as well, but what we see is an important rise in uh, slow release oral morphine, uh, and that's most of the patient that, that, that change from methadone to, to morphine. Uh, and it's really amazing to hear what they tell how much better they feel and how much better they can cope with life 
with a medication that fits better. That's a lot of quality of life you can get out of a change of medication. And I, I think pretty soon we will have more patients in slow re uh, under slow uh, uh, release oral morphine than methadone. This is something, um, we did a, a survey in, in Switzerland, um, about 300 patients, and I was really amazed about that, to, to, to see how many didn't know exactly what substances were uh, available at all when they got into treatment. And many of them just started treatment out because they, they know this and this substance, and they, they, or they have already had, and they want to continue that. And they, they, it's not an informed choice, many of them. Only in Switzerland, where we have now heroin-assisted treatment for 22 years, only not even half of the patients know about heroin-assisted treatment. This is amazing, isn't it? Um, so I, I think this has also to do with us, like um, specialists. We have to inform the patients better and, and see that they can decide autonomously uh, uh, about their uh, treatment. That's a curve we see uh, in many countries, I think, uh, that the peak of the heroin epidemic, uh, that's not uh, that, like uh, Canton of Zurich, that was in the early 90s, and since then uh, numbers go back of people beginning with heroin uh, use, and we are now uh, on like the level we have had before the, the, the beginning of the epi epidemic in the 70s. So there's not so many starting new, and not amazingly, um, we have uh, an aging population. They are not aging like a year per year in average, but it's a three quarters of a year per year. So um, you see that this graph is ha heroin assisted treatment these were the young, the young patients. Uh, in the beginning there were some, now we have hardly any. And this is the, the younger, middle-aged, and this is, yeah, well, the really middle-aged. And you see that <coughs> the older groups are growing constantly. And we see the same in the regular uh, opiate substitution treatments. It's, it's a linear <coughs> growth in, in age. So it's about 42 or 45 years of age now uh, in, in, in our population. And same with the, the, the causes of death. Uh, I mean, the coverage is good and, and people don't die of um, intoxication that much anymore. If they die of intoxication, it's a um, combined in, uh, intoxication. We have already heard about that. Um, it's with, combined with alcohol or benzodiazepines, uh, most uh, cocaine. Um, the, the most important factor why people die in our treatments now is for, for complications uh, of that liver failure, uh, hepatitis C, uh, combined with alcohol use. Um, and now growing number with uh, um, COPD, uh, lung problems, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, and cancer. So that's a problem about the aging um, um, population and the comorbid comorbidities. And I think this will even grow as a problem, and we have to address that. So to, to sum this up, um, I think most important thing about treatment is access. Access and uh, information and to, to enable patients to, to do the, the choice of the best substance. Um, and, and I think this is something the patient has to decide on. We cannot decide what uh, substance works best for what patient. Um, take home dosages. That's, um, I think, one of the, in my view, uh, as we have heard, um, opioid addiction is a chronic disease, uh, and we did count with years and years, 10, 15 years of treatment. And um, I think people have to have the possibility to, to live their life and they shouldn't be obliged to come to a clinic every day. So uh, take-homes is very important. 
So to, to go shortly through HAT, there is a, like, as you have heard already, 23 centers, four in the big cities. Um, the spe spe special thing about um, heroin is is a prodrug. It doesn't act itself, but it's um, like lipophilic, and it gets into the brain, that, which is a fatty mass, much faster. So it, the, the, the action is uh, like faster and stronger than compared with morphine. Um, this is the number of head patients, 1,500 in Switzerland. Uh, this is like, the legal restrictions we have, and we try to, to, to handle flexibly. Um, it's still pretty complicated to get into it. it doesn't, it's not like uh, the other treatments, the 20 minutes. Uh, you have to apply with the federal government, and it takes about two weeks until we have the patients into head. This is the retention. Uh, we, we, we count with uh, like treatments 10 to 15 years. Uh, in average, and we have many patients coming back in, uh, after they, they uh, finish treatment, coming back into treatment again. It's cost e effective. This has been proven in many countries over the world. Uh, it's factors from two to four to ten how much money you save uh, with a patient in head compared uh, not being in head. Which, a very important thing I, I want to share with you to, to, to close up is the shift from injectable heroin to uh, oral heroin we see in our centers. Um, uh, it's 47% now that are using um, um, tablets only and they, they don't inject anymore. And I think this is from the harm reduction point of view very important and good news. So tablets, uh, oral um, heroin is a very important um, treatment offer, I think. Um, we have now the possibility to, to give two, take, two days take home dosages in, in uh, head treatment. That's since the revision of the uh, narcotic law uh, passed 2008. And 50% of our patients handle these take-homes without problems. And we don't have problems with uh, like uh, dealing uh, or, or anything like that. We have had this. Um, this is just the practicalities. Um, people, uh, patients can inject up to six times per day if they're injecting in our clinics. Um, it's a maximum dose of 1,200 milligrams. It's 200 milligrams per injection, max. And uh, same scheme with uh, tablets. And they do those individually. They, they decide themselves how much of, and they do often combine with, um, with uh, long-acting substances like methadone and growing number with slow-release oral morphine. And they do combine them the substances by themselves, and, and we just um, assist there. Um, so, to sum the whole thing up, um, good coverage and, and retention in, uh, of the patients in treatment, that's the priority goal uh, in, in harm reduction, that's our goal. Um, I think heroin assisted treatment is a very important and essential part of a comprehensive treatment offer uh, for uh, opiate addicted people um, because there is an important group uh, that just that doesn't tolerate regular substitution medications and we have to address them otherwise we lose them um, and the increasing proportion of oral um, heroin treatment which is really good news and uh, I think that the great potential of, of heroin as a uh, of the, the diacetyl morphine as a, as a treatment offer and uh, I would be so happy if we could just get diacetyl morphine uh, in a legal state that would enable us to offer it in the same way we do uh, like methadone or slow release oral morphine in Switzerland or buprenorphine. So thank you for your attention. Um. Thank you, Jared.